the area around Lake Bullock is notoriously difficult to manage. The soils range from sandy lunettes, the uh, history of past salinity, right down to current saline depressions. Farmers have used a number of viable options to help with this. Saltbush, bluebush, so the Marianas, the creeping saltbush, Encalina, uh, a, a whole range of shrubs have enabled people to turn unproductive land into productive sites. Lake Bullock normally takes about two years to fill. That's the historic uh, perspective. After the January 11 floods or February 11 floods, Lake Bullock filled in three weeks. Some of our investment was lost because of that. How it comes out of the floods is yet to be determined. But further up in the catchment, we've found that salt bush that was flooded for only a short time has survived. And in fact, there is a seed bank in the soil and is reshooting. So we've got our fingers crossed for some of these lower areas that got wet. Much of the lower Richardson River is saline. The land's notoriously difficult to manage. The viable options of salt bush, blue bush has given farmers a real boost. The land was formerly unproductive and now it's a real asset, particularly since we've had these dry times. The shots clearly show that the plants are surviving after the floods. David Feller through the assistance of the Sustainable Soils Project has been able to establish native grasses on some difficult soil on the west side of Lake Bullock. It's this paddock here is it's close to Lake Bullock, very close. Uh, in fact, some of it was encroached by the lake. Uh, it's just a very messy paddock that goes from some very hard stony stuff to sandy stuff and it's really only good for barley or cereals or pasture and um, it's just been ideal for trying out this trial we've uh, for trying out the native pasture and last year we um, well I sowed um, Danthonia and kangaroo grass uh, put a lot of time into it too I mean it's one thing getting a bale of um, two uh, no sorry five wool packs of seed next thing is how to spread those five wool packs over about 150 acres and I did a lot of experimenting and finally I ended up uh, putting it all through a mulcher to break up a bit of the fluffiness of all the seeds and then slowly bucket by bucket into a um, cement mixer, mixed it with gypsum and got a gypsum truck who we finally managed to get it out and spread the whole paddock and the results have been quite surprising. The Sustainable Soils Project has been of great benefit to the community. Professional speakers, people out of left field, people with in-depth knowledge of a particular subject has been a key, one of the success stories of the group. Doris Blessing has visited the group on two occasions and her visits are always looked forward to by the community. She's very down to earth. She gets out there with you. We had pits dug and looked at our our soil profile and um, you know sometimes you can get hung up about oh you know you've got a little bit of salinity or you've got a bit of this but she puts it very plainly and easily to you think that well it's not going to work straight away it's going to take a period of time and 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 the direction in which you should go uh, we had um, Colin Sice and uh, Christine oh, what's Christine's her name Jones on the um, talking about the pastures and the soil biology. Um, yeah, the, I think the native grasses is it's a hard one. Um, we've had a go at them for two years running, and we've probably had a little bit of uh, trouble with you know we've no sooner planted than we got flooded. Then we've had another um, did one lot got flooded, then did a bit more and got flooded again on it. Um, so it's hard to monitor what sort of success we're going to have but it's a long process too it can take um, you know quite a few years before it actually can be established so we're hoping that our grass seeds are all still there and um, will come up 
Um, so that side with Colin and the grasses, uh, he sort of influenced us there to um, plant them. And uh, Christine with the soil biology, you know, just thinking about the, um, the health of your soil that, that you've got to, um, you know, we've, with the cropping side of things, we're big with sprays and things, but at the same time, you've got to try and keep those microbes active and healthy and for long-term cropping and long-term farming and sustainability, I think. There's so much on soil health that we don't understand. I can remember some years ago, people making a statement, the soil's only there to hold the jolly plant in place. Well, we had to get past that mentality and spray everything out and then get back to say, well, uh, this soil is a living and we have to make sure that life continues in the soil. So um, I think we have a lot to learn in soil science, but um, we, um, as we get more exposure to these speakers, I think we will learn more about it. This is a soil moisture probe and it's one west of Donald out towards Litchfield on David and Marge Fellows place. Um, these are pretty simple device. They're obviously activated by the solar panel and farmers can get a reading about every seven minutes of the moisture in the paddy. Uh, the moisture probe uh, this year is, um, is going to be helpful for me in my planning of my uh, cropping program uh, because the area where I want to, where it is at the moment, I was looking at growing uh, chickpeas. Now if there's insufficient um, moisture at sowing, I'll probably uh, look at changing my plan there and, and, not, and not growing the chickpea crop because of the, uh, the risk that they'll fail and, and that uh, yeah, we expose ourselves to, uh, you know, to having very low ground cover and having the issues of, of both uh, wind and uh, water erosion. The, um, the moisture probes that we have around our area are going to be fantastic for us to, um, to work out exactly, um, exactly how we are getting our moisture, um, how much we are going to require um, for a crop. And it's going to eliminate or help eliminate a lot of the risk that uh, we have um, in our crop production and hopefully help um, make the decisions at cropping time or even with our pastures um, in regards to whether we take our crops through to harvest or we cut for hay or whether we top drift nitrogen um, and those, those sorts of management decisions. One of the most successful parts of the program uh, for me personally, uh, and it may be for the others different, but the, uh, the thing I enjoyed seeing was the farmers all getting together in one room